So, in other words, we're discussing religious belief and whether it counts as knowledge. I already said, I don't care about knowledge. Okay, fine. You don't want me to know that God exists because I can't be absolutely certain? Okay, fine. I don't care. I don't need knowledge for anything. So, um, it's important to me that people continue to believe that the world is rational and, and intelligible and knowable. My enthusiasm for how much I don't care about the concept of knowledge actually caused me to knock the computer over and that our and and, and 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 that our minds were made to know the world i don't care about knowledge i well i i, I gotta say I, I i know a thing or two about the theory of knowledge um so that's not the problem i just don't care um it's important to me that people continue to believe that the world is rational and, and intelligible and knowable and that our and and and, and 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 that our minds were made to know the world. So, in other words, we're discussing religious belief and whether it counts as knowledge. I already said I don't care about knowledge. Okay, fine. You don't want me to know that God exists because I can't be absolutely certain? Okay, fine. I don't care. I don't need knowledge for anything. So, um, it's important to me that people continue to believe that the world is rational and, and intelligible and knowable. My enthusiasm for how much I don't care about the concept of knowledge actually caused me to knock the computer over and that our and and, and 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 that our minds were made to know the world i don't care about knowledge i well i i, I gotta say I, I i know a thing or two about the theory of knowledge um so that's not the problem i just don't care um it's important to me that people continue to believe that the world is rational and, and intelligible and knowable and that our and, and 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 that our minds were made to know the world. So, in other words, we're discussing religious belief and whether it counts as knowledge. I already said I don't care about knowledge. Okay, fine. You don't want me to know that God exists because I can't be absolutely certain. Okay, fine. I don't care. I don't need knowledge for anything. So, um, it's important to me that people continue to believe that the world is rational and, and intelligible and knowable. My enthusiasm for how much I don't care about the concept of knowledge actually caused me to knock the computer over and that our and and, and 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 that our minds were made to know the world i don't care about knowledge i well i i, I gotta say I, I i know a thing or two about the theory of knowledge um so that's not the problem i just don't care um it's important to me that people continue to believe that the world is rational and, and intelligible and knowable and that our and, and 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 that our minds were made to know the world. So, in other words, we're discussing. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, Tom Jump. Uh, oh, I should let him know I'm live right now. He'll be joining me after. Um, it's the platform I'm using is having problems to have Tom on at the same time as me playing a video. So I'm going to just uh, show the parts and give my thoughts of this debate between Tom Jump and Dr. Trent Dougherty. Dougherty? People actually, um, I think from a Spanish background, spell my first name, Doug, the same way as his f first part of his last name, Doe. And so I always found that interesting. They put an H, H there. I don't understand that. I guess they hear an H, Doug. <sighs> I don't know. But uh, Trent Dougherty. Doherty, Doherty, Doherty. Uh, he's a philosopher, I believe, a philosopher of religion. And they had a very entertaining um, debate the other day. I actually think they agreed on a lot of things that, but it just sounded like they didn't. But that's, we'll get into that. And maybe if there's time, um, I might go into the video of Tom Jump and Eric Hernandez. Remember that one from a while back? Oh, but that's a mess. Oh, that's a mess. But I'm going to give some thoughts on how I would handle a guy like um, like Trent and where I would go. And Tom, if you listen, listen, you can make notes, see if you agree with me or not. Um, if there's, you know, yeah, make notes. And when you come on, we can talk about it. But I think you miss some key opportunities with a guy like Trent. So I'm going to start with, by the way, they butchered your, your opening statements, Tom. Like, it's, the audio came in and out. I think Cameron was experimenting with a new platform and didn't know how to use it properly. And so I'm just going to go straight into uh, what Trent's opening statements. And then I'm, um, actually, you know what? No, no, I take that back. I'm going to go, go into a question that Adam Does SE asked, 
which is a question I would have asked, in the Q&A portion. And it is about his background, his personal testimony. And I think it's another example of someone who takes the positions that they do because they don't want to feel stupid for believing a man rose from the dead. Okay, so this is Dr. Trent Horn, Trent Horn? No, Dr. Trent Dougherty's well, John testimony. Pollock, Technical Methods and Philosophy, the PDF's available online. It's a wonderful, I always use it for my first course I teach in set theory. All right, this one is from Adam Does SE. This one is for Trent. What is Trent's Christian testimony? How, when did he become a Christian? So I, I got born again when I was 16. I was, uh, by 16, a burned out party boy. Uh, raised uh, what I call pessimistic agnostic. My parents didn't know whether there was a God, but they sure hope not. And that was basically my position. Um, I was uh, tall for my age, gregarious. Got into a lot of partying with college kids when I was like, 13, 14, 15, it's crazy. Okay, this is why he's a Christian today. This is why he first got into Christianity. He, uh, he was an early developer, <laughs> big boy at an early age, started hanging out with the wrong crowd. Uh, my guess is, I don't know this for certain, but my guess is he felt tremendous amounts of guilt for some of the things he's done. Maybe it had to do with drugs. Maybe it had to do with women. And anyhow, he somehow got into Christianity, maybe, oh, Trent Horn, why do I call you Trent Horn? Trent Doherty, if you ever hear this, um, these are the questions I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to ask you, was it a, a, a young lady who invited you to church? <laughs> um, so I got uh, born again, came forward an altar call when I was 16, very precocious, asking a lot of questions, very curious. Um, then by, by 18, I was a ordained Southern Baptist uh, minister. By 18, an ordained Southern Baptist minister and came from a agnostic household, Christian by 16, probably because of guilt. Um, it's one of those things where Christians, I think, believe that unless you have Jesus in your life, you're going to make, you're going to sin. You're going to do all these bad things. And they don't realize it's just being stupid. That when you're a kid, you make mistakes. And, um, and, but they think that the only way they can avoid making these mistakes is to ask Jesus in their heart rather than just wise up and learn from their mistakes. Went to Liberty University Seminary after that. Then um, Liberty University, that's very conservative. Went back and, and just gradually sort of got really interested in history and ended up becoming Episcopal, looking at Eastern Orthodox Church, became Roman Catholic. Whoa, whoa. How do you go from being a Baptist, going to Liberty University, to becoming more Orthodox? Did he say Catholic? And ended up becoming Episcopal, looking at Eastern Orthodox Church, became Roman Catholic, but was evangelical for a really long time. Okay, I hope, if there's a God, I pray. I pray I'm wrong here. The woman he's married to now, I bet, <laughs> was a Roman Catholic when he met her. Oh, I hope I'm wrong. Trent, tell me I'm wrong. Because how do you go from being a highly conservative evangelical Baptist to becoming an Orthodox uh, Roman Catholic type? And my guess is this is in your early 20s. Am I wrong? Did you meet a beautiful Catholic girl, Trent? Is that what happened? <laughs> oh, I see T-Jump's in the, um, in the chat. So yeah, T-Jump, make notes of uh, anything you want to say. And so it was just basically straight old, good old-fashioned, preaching the gospel that I heard for the first time. And I was like, wow, this is nothing I've ever heard before. And I, I resisted it and resisted it and resisted it and resisted it. But, you know, like C.S. Lewis said, I got dragged kicking. I didn't want to become a Christian. No, I really didn't. I resisted it for all I was worth. But the power of the Holy Spirit took its lasso and reined me in. Yes, it's, Christianity is very attractive to people who are down on themselves, who are feeling tremendous amounts of guilt, who have screwed up in life 
because Christianity offers a clean slate. And Trent, when he was 16 years old, was desperate for a clean slate, a fresh start. Someone showed him love. Someone probably invited him to a church service. Probably was a female. Don't know. And, um, and that's how the ball got started. And... Um, Okay, I want to play now. <laughs> Is that too cynical? Hey, Paul, welcome here. Oh, and welcome to uh, any newcomers. Let me know um, if I don't catch you here in the live stream. Uh, I'll catch you on the replay. I watch the replay and uh, make sure to read all the comments. So if you're new here, just uh, let me know. And Max B, yes, a thousand pine points for you. Don't spend it all in one place. I want to go to uh, Trent's um, opening statement. Now, remember... This whole discussion is entitled, What is the Proper Epistemology for Religion? Epistemology is the study of knowledge. It's how we come to know things. That's what it's about. And I, for those of you who came late, I played a nice uh, loop <laughs> of Trent saying he doesn't care about knowledge. But you know what? I know what he means when he says that. I really do. And it's not as bad as that loop made it out to be, although it kind of was. But um, I'm going to let um, Trent describe it for himself here. I think I do know, and I would invite um, Mr. Jump to follow suit in that, and after my little spiel, tell me some things that he thinks he knows as well as he knows anything else. Because if we have examples of things that we think we know, then we can tell how much common ground we have. And if we don't, well, then that could be a problem. Um, but I do. I will have some <clears throat> some questions about some of the terminology that was that was used there. Um, so for me, my fundamental starting point is evidentialism. Um, I've always been an evidentialist by nature. Um, I went to the University of Rochester to study evidentialism more intently with um, two founding figures there. Um, while in grad school, um, I really sifted through arguments for and against evidentialism that made their way into this book, Evidentialism and Its Discontents. Um, and uh, you gotta love the marketing. I, you know, I personally suck at marketing. I'm that's I'm really bad at marketing myself. I really don't care, uh, but maybe I should more. But I, it, it amazes me how guys like Trent and even Cameron Bertuzzi, like they have no shame. <laughs> it's like uh, like subscribe, buy my books. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just the way I was raised. I gotta fix myself somehow. Uh, you might have heard it. Readers are. Listeners, watchers might have heard of W.K. Clifford's statement of evidentialism. It's wrong always and everywhere for any reason to believe anything, not on sufficient evidence. Thumbs up. I like it. And but I'm all. But I also think Cameron that um, you know you talked. You use the word knowledge, and uh, Tom uses well a lot of a lot of words, but proof and and certainty and all these. I don't think any of these binary notions are very helpful. Honestly. Okay, I agree with uh, Trent here. He is basically saying knowledge is not like a, a, a switch, a light switch. That's either all knowledge or all not knowledge. And let me tell you, um, his conservative first upbringings into the Christian faith, they're not going to like this. Uh, if he views knowledge, if Trent views knowledge as, uh, as a belief that exists in degrees of probability, which I think is what he's saying here, then what he's going to end up saying is that the God that he believes in and he worships and serves, I think, is a probability to him. Trent, how would you like it if, if you said, um, I, I have a high degree of confidence that my wife exists, that she probably loves me, <laughs> that I probably love her. That kind of just spoils the love, doesn't it? <laughs> I believe love's a choice, but not, not a feeling. But anyhow, you see what I'm getting at? And this is why a lot of Christians are going to push back against you, Trent, when you believe they, they want knowledge to be this, this light switch that it, either God is real or he's not. And as far as you're concerned, Trent, you should believe that. He's, he either exists or he doesn't. It's either true that he exists or it's not true. And so... You should view truth and knowledge that's in that same way. A lot of Christians would say, I think. But I, I lean more on your side, Trent. I actually do think that um, when it comes to 
things like truth and knowledge. It's like um, a line up here. And then our beliefs about things can approach truth, but maybe never, ever quite touch it. We can get close on some things, but on other things, maybe we're still way down here. And I th I'm hearing you say that, that it's not like either the line on the top or a zero at the bottom. It's not the light switch. It's, it's a probab probability curve. So I don't really like to talk much about belief or knowledge or proof or any other binary property. What I'm interested in is the degree of certainty that I have a right to in any given proposition. Um, so the kind of evidentialism that I hold to is proportionalism and, or probabilism. And so when you take evidentialism and run it through a probabilistic filter, you basically get um, the Enlightenment view. And so uh, Hume put it a little more eloquently than Locke did, but they both said the same thing. Hume says, the wise person proportions their belief to the strength of the evidence. And that is my fundamental methodological commitment to, to attempt to proportion my belief to the strength of the evidence to encourage others to do, to, to do so. I think that is a benchmark of intellectual integrity. And Okay, you know what, Tom, if you're listening, uh, well, I guess this is his intro, so you can't really interrupt him. But from this point, as soon as you hear him say this, you have to push him hard on giving you his sense of probabilities on certain claims. Push him to answer certain questions, like, what's the probability that this phone will fall when I let go? Give me a number between 0 and 100. Do that for things that he is going to say, like, 99.9 .9 on a lot, of, a lot of those claims, and then throw in things like, what's your confidence? What's your degree of certainty? What's the probability that a man named Jesus cast demons out of pigs and they ran into a gulch and died? These are the questions that guys like Trent will hate to answer. He does not want to talk about these things. He does not want to give a comparison of probabilities, I don't think, between Jesus being an exorcist and Jesus walking on water and things falling from the sky and landing on the ground because of gravity. But really what he just said, you should be able to ask him these questions because he said something to the effect of you got to proportion your beliefs to the evidence at hand. And so, okay, test him on that. Let's see how consistent he is. Because if he starts to rate his probability that Jesus rose from the dead higher than this phone falling when I let go, I tell you, people can see through that so quickly and see how insincere he is and disingenuous. And, um, and it's my fundamental methodological starting point. Now, substantively, um, uh, I'm a, basically what you might call a common sense realist. I think that uh, most of what science says is uh, pretty accurate. Um, and probably true. Science can never get it perfect, um, but I think science gets most things mostly right, and that progress in science is not, as um, the paradigm shift folks would think, just um, switching from one thing to another. I think it's pretty much steady progress, though with, you know, saltations now and then. Um, and so I think math and science are hallmarks of intellectual activity, and that, um, we ought to look to them as examples and emulate them. And so... Uh, now listen to this. A lot of Christians are going to... I'm going to use the word hate. They're going, to, they're going to hate what he's saying here. That you look to the method of science when discussing religious issues? Tom said a lot of stuff, but I didn't... I'm not sure I got an answer to the question. What is the proper epistemology of religion? My answer is very, very simple. The proper epistemology of religion is exactly that of science exactly that of science see this is where he's going to run into trouble because he's admitted that he should um, apportion his confidence based on the evidence at hand and I think Tom you should have pushed him at later on in the discussion that on certain claims on this planet doesn't matter if you're a Hindu a Buddhist a Muslim a Jew a Taoist an atheist that there are certain claims that when scientists look at the evidence, they all converge at a single conclusion or outcome. That when they take a protocol, when they take a, an experiment and reproduce it, doesn't matter if you're in India or in the United States or Japan, that you'll get the same answer. Now, Trent, 
if you ever watch this replay, ask yourself if that works in religion. You said that we should use an epistemology for religion similar to what we use for science. In science, it's all about reproducibility, taking um, I, went, I, got, I have a master's in analytical chemistry. We, we, we'd have lab notes where we have our procedures written down, our protocols in detail, so that we could give the book to someone else across the ocean and say, here, run this experiment. These are the results I got. Let's see if you get the same results. That's how science works. And we, then that's how we build our confidence in certain claims. Now try that with religion. Try that with the nature of a deity. Trent, if you were to ask a Hindu, what is God like compared to a Christian, a Baptist Christian? <laughs> Do you think you'd get the same answer? Maybe there on some things you'd get similar answers, but on a lot of things you'd get contradictory answers. Without exception. Exact, not similar, but exactly the same. Because I think the epistemology of everything is exactly the same, and it's approximately described by Bayesian confirmation theory. And that the axioms of... There's a lot of Roman Catholics. I, you call yourself a Roman Catholic now, right, Trent? There's a, Roman, a lot of Roman Catholics who are just vehemently disagreeing with you right now. They're going to say that you're making a category error. You can't treat God like, um, like atoms, like an experiment in the lab. You can't put God in a fume hood and suck up those wonderful vapors. <laughs> it's... There's different ways to come into knowledge, they say, when it comes to God. It's a spiritual knowledge. You can't use empirical type knowledge, Trent. Of standard uh, probability theory, as axiomatized by Kamogorov or other people, uh, are regulative ideals for degrees of belief. And so, um, so rather than try to untangle the stuff from Tom's uh, opening uh, monologue, um, I would like to actually hear him tell me what are some things that he thinks he knows. Oh, I didn't give my example. So, for example, I think um, I think I. So I'll say I know. I think I know that humans and chimps share a common ancestor. I think I know there are other planets. I think I know that there are atoms and subatomic particles. Um, more importantly, I think it's very probably true that those things exist and behave approximately the way that. Contemporary physics uh, says they do. I think chemistry is approximately correct in what it says about uh, water boiling and things like that. I think. Okay, see, this is a perfect example, Tom, that later on you should ask them okay, what's the probability in your mind that water does indeed boil at 100 degrees Celsius at sea level? Have them actually give you a number and then ask him the same type of question for. Um, a claim of Jesus. What's the probability that Elijah was next to Jesus during the transfiguration in the book of Mark? I tell you, he will hate that question because he's just admitted that the same way we come to know things in science is the way we should apply to religion. But you'll notice that he, I think if he's honest, he'll have to say like he's Close, as close as to 100% as you can be in his confidence that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. It's almost by definition, by the way. Um, but in relative terms, that water boiling at 100 degrees Celsius at sea level versus uh, 1,000 feet up into the atmosphere, you know, that's probably a better question. Anyhow, uh, he would have to admit that he would have to lower his confidence on certain miracle claims in the Bible, I think. And that might... He's going to lose a lot of Christians in his corner, in his camp, in his tribe, if he does that. Biology is fundamentally correct in what it says about the history of evolution. And I think physics is largely correct about what it says about the atomic world and the subatomic world. And so those are examples of things I think I know. And I'm wondering if Tom thinks he knows those things. Yeah, um, I don't know if, Tom, you actually answered that question. But I want to, um, I want to skip ahead to the Q&A session, because there was a lot of good questions there. And um, let me see if I can just summarize. I think what Tom was trying to say is that, what I was saying earlier, that we have this thing called truth up here, on let's say on a graph, and we might not ever be able to reach it. 
but that's the metaphysical truth, the way things actually are. And what's important is how we get there. What methods do we use to get there for certain knowledge claims? And I think Trent's saying something similar. He, he doesn't like that whole binary switch idea that you either have truth or you don't. You either have knowledge or you don't. That it's dependent on probabilities and the evidence. And I agree with him there. And so the main thing at this point would be to show, to chip away at his confidence on certain religious claims that he might have. Because later on, well, let's get to it. Later on, he talks about, um, oh, where is it? No, it's not in the Q&A, is it? I'll, I'll find it later. So let me just get to this question here. This one's from Josh Brister, Apologist Supreme. He says, can you ask T-Jump how his philosophy is livable? I, I guess that's directed to you, Tom. Yeah, it's, it's just as livable as anything else in science. Like, if you imagine a kid playing a video game, you can play the video game without knowing what made the video game. You're just not even relevant information. All right, this one is for Trent. Okay, that question I played for a reason. It shows the kind of the existential angst of a lot of believers. It's like they can't understand, they can't believe. How, how can you not believe in any God? How is that livable? How can you get up in the morning? Why do you get up in the morning, Tom, if there's no God? What's wrong with you? How can you have a justification, the, a basis of, for all these things? Is that, that's what that question was getting at, is, is that total perplexment <laughs> of how do you do it? How do you live without this concept of a God? From the truest. He says, if your God is unobservable, how do you justify claims of observing it? Same way I do with atoms. Okay. Make predictions, make observations. Okay, like, <laughs> the question was, if God is hidden, how do you see him? Truest. He says, if your God is unobservable, how do you justify claims of observing it? Same way I do with atoms. Same way I do with atoms. Trent, are you aware that we can actually weigh an atom? Same way you do with atoms. Question, how much does Yahweh weigh? Now, that might sound like a stupid question, but you're the one who said... You observe Yahweh the same way you observe atoms. By claims of observing it. Same way I do with atoms. We can, if I have 6.023 times 10 to the 23 atoms of hydrogen, uh, let's, use, uh, let's use lithium. Lithium weighs 4 grams for every 6.203 times 10 to the 23 atoms of lithium. We can weigh it. You can actually, when you have that amount of atoms of lithium, you can see it. You can hold it in your hand. Can you hold God in your hand, <laughs> Trent? Okay. Make predictions. Make observations. Okay, yes. Predictions. I, I think Tom asked, maybe Tom, you didn't ask about certain predictions of, um, like, what? Here's a prediction I have about God. If a God exists and he cares about his creation, that's a big, big thing, caring. If he cares about, for example, how they behave towards one another, you would think that cultures around the world would have evolved in a certain way that there would be no disagreements about what this God wants and desires. You would think there'd be no disagreements on even who this God is, what his nature is like. Do we see that? I predict that's what would happen if this God cared and exists. Exists, number one, cared, number two. Now, I understand that reasonable people disagree, and maybe some reasonable people out there say, no, I don't have that expect expectation of a God. I would expect this God wouldn't care uh, what people think of him or know of him or do. Uh, 
And, you know, we have the Bible and, and we have rules in there. They've got the Ten Commandments. And the only reason why the Hindus don't, don't believe some of it is because of sin, Doug, don't you know? All right. Uh, this one is from Kyle Alexander. I like the Truist, though. That's a, that's a really cool name. The Truist. That's very cool. This one is for Tom. Is it possible for you to be wrong about your claim that we can't know about the nominal? Absolutely. There could absolutely be a way that we could discover that could give us information about the nominal that we don't have yet. And I, you know what? I think if Trent was asked a similar question, Trent, could you be wrong that God exists? I think he would say yes. But maybe I'm wrong about that. See, that's Tom. That's another question I would have loved asked of him is if you believe that um, you sh your epistemology about religion sh or about God should be the same as science, then what's your probability, based on the evidence, that your God even exists? He can't say 100. He really can't. Because he's admitted that he doesn't care for this binary switch idea of knowledge and truth. Okay, um, let's go to the next question that I found interesting. To, to Trent, and then you guys can go back and forth on it. This one is from Matthew 1. The question is, why can't we know that God exists through experiencing the beauty of nature? Well, I think we can. I mean, but I think it's, um, uh, I think that that is, um, yeah, it's like a, kind of like a direct experience of God. I do think that an inference or an inferential process goes on in the mind. The mind's often making sort of unconscious inferences. Um, I just wrote about that in this book, which is a really awesome account of the use of evidence and evidentialism. More marketing. Um, so I just, I just wrote about this concept of... Un yes, Ald Lang Sign. Uh, we're going to get to that, but he definitely thinks that we're reading, that he's reading history when he reads the Gospels. Conscious inference and immediate inferences. And I do think that... Um, I absolutely think you can know that God exists just in virtue of experiences of nature. I got a story about how that happens in a paper called something like Reforming Reformed Epistemology or something like that. Tom, what are your thoughts? No, beauty can't indicate that there's a God any more than hunger can indicate there's a God or itching or, or hairiness. No. Yeah, it's, that's a great answer, Tom. Um, does beauty indicate a God? If the answer is yes, then wouldn't ugliness indicate that maybe there is no God, the opposite of beauty? <laughs> but a Christian, a theist, would never admit that. They'd say, no, no, beauty shows that there's a God, and even ugliness shows that there's a God. It's like heads I win, tails you, you, you lose. It's like, I just got to believe this. I think all of those things indicate to some degree that there's a God. I because love itching, cause itching is a conscious state. I think... I think uh, every conscious state is some evidence that God exists. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with most, most uh, physicists and naturalists and scientists to say, yeah, nope. Uh, that is, it is not the case that most physicists think that. Citation, please. That most but, physicists think what? That most physicists don't think that consciousness, or at <laughs> least I, I couldn't tell if he's saying that there's no consciousness. or. Consciousness. Now he's backtracking a bit. Consciousness doesn't indicate God. I think he's trying to say that. Yeah, I think he's trying to say that like most physicists are naturalists about the mind, like physicalists. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether or not that's true. It, it just utterly, I don't really. Tom, isn't there um, a survey on that? Now, I, I, a lot of philosophers will reject that survey, but I think I remember seeing a survey about that. Care, but. Yeah. So I think. But that, just, I mean, look, there's a lot of freaking theists in that. I mean, a lot of, a lot of. There's a lot of theists in physics. In fact, what's interesting is that the more fundamental a science you get to, the more theists there are. More well, we theists a, in chemistry than biology, more theists in physics than chemistry. We have a couple minutes. So, what, Trent, why don't you just explain why you think that conscious states are evidence for God? Yeah, this, is, um, this reminded me of, Tom, your conversation with Eric Hernandez. A lot of Christians think that if there is no God, then... There's no such thing as thinking, really. There's no such thing as, as truth, as knowledge, um, that, they, that <laughs> they correctly, I think, understand in a way that if there is no God, then we are animals and we're not special. And this is what bothers them. It's like they rather believe in a myth than accept the fact that 
that we are like orangutans, except our consciousness abilities are much, much higher. Hey, thank you, Jamie Tikil. My small thanks for the great content. Well, thank you for, uh, for listening. Uh, because I think uh, they are utterly inexplicable in terms of the physical. Are you I think that, like, you know, I mean, Jaguan Kim did his did his level best to try to naturalize consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness just has not been cracked. It's been, it's been. Okay, listen carefully to what he's about to say. Too tough for even the best minds, um, and uh, I think if, if they were going to figure it out, they'd figure it out by now. It's just consciousness is something wholly other than than. Than nature it just shows there's a shows there's just reality physical realities like swiss cheese because it's just shot through with billions and billions of minds sounds a whole lot like an argument from ignorance ah we can't explain lightning with all the greatest technology of three thousand years ago ah must be zeus genius watch his expression here he does not push back i don't know if he did this on purpose but it, it it was amazing to me his facial ex like he's he's dead faced it's like he realizes that what tom is saying is actually true that he's basically just said humans can't explain this concept of consciousness therefore god a lot like an argument from ignorance ah we can't explain lightning with all the greatest technology of three thousand years ago ah must be zeus genius watch Okay. Uh, yeah, I actually think he. This was a, in a way, a smart strategy from Trent not to say anything there, because he wants Christians to watch what Tom just did and just see. Look at that mocking, mock, mock, mock. God shall not be mocked, because <laughs> Tom used the word Zeus. So, um, so if I were Trent in that case, I wouldn't say anything because he kind of knows that he's, it's an argument from ignorance, but. Um, but because you mentioned the Zeus, he can just stay quiet and, in a way, play the victim. Moving on. So this one is from Midi Wave Productions. This one is to Tom. What is the probability that a determinist can have knowledge? No, Anthony Magnabosco, it wasn't a frozen screen. I, I still saw, like, something moving. <laughs> uh, no idea. Like, yeah, that's a weird, my it's knowledge. Question. I mean, if you're saying, can a determinist have knowledge, the answer is yes. I mean, you could be determined by reality or truth to believe reality or truth, and therefore you would have knowledge. Okay, this is very important, because remember, for the people who came late, I played a, a loop of uh, Trent admitting he, he doesn't care about knowledge. And the thing is, what he really meant is he doesn't care about absolute knowledge, but he many times he didn't qualify it. But anyhow... Um, and so now we're getting into the idea of determinism. And you can tell that what's about to unfold is that um, Trent really does care about knowledge. Because if he really didn't, then he wouldn't care that we're just animals. And what we call knowledge is just things we attribute to certain predictions coming true and so forth. Probability, like, I don't know. Anything to add on that, Trent? Um... I think if determinism were true, um, there would be no not nobody would have any knowledge. But I do think that determinists can have knowledge because, fortunately, their determinist views are mistaken. Fortunately, their deterministic views are mistaken. So he's viewing that as a good thing that determinists are wrong. Why is that a good thing if you don't care about knowledge? Because he does care about knowledge. Um, he does. He views. He's almost like a presuppositionalist where Trent views that without God, there cannot be truth, knowledge. You don't have the um, preconditions for intelligibility. He's basically uh, a glorified Psi 10 Brugenkate in a way. However, he still puts his foot in the evidential camp. And this is where guys like him and Psi 10 Brugenkate and, and Greg Bonson and all these other great uh, theologians... Um, would would differ because they would say you cannot say oh the god i worship and serve probably exists is that is that how you worship god trent that he probably is there but maybe not oh i'd like to ask about that one why do you think that you can't have knowledge as a determinist because if the situation if there if determinism is true for the reasons that it's usually taken to be true um naturalism then there are no minds and therefore there are no states of knowledge but yes if anything by 
That's that's exactly it. And this is was your whole conversation, Tom, with Eric Hernandez. Uh, what is it, a month ago? Um, Trent summarized Eric Hernandez's position right there. Is true for the reasons that it's usually taken to be true. Um, naturalism, then there are no minds, and therefore there are no states of knowledge of anything by anyone ever. Yeah, without <laughs> if if determinism is true. If there is no such thing as free will, then there's no minds, there's no such thing as knowledge and truth, and we're just ants. Humans are ants, Tom. And Trent doesn't want to be an ant. So don't say that determinism is true, because being an ant doesn't feel good. Well, determinism just states that all events are predetermined. That's it. So they could be, our beliefs could be determined to correspond to reality by reality. So it seems possible, knowledge is possible. Well, all I can do is repeat myself. If you're talking about a case where, if that where um, reality is the way it's typically taken to be to justify determinism, namely all-out naturalism, then there are no. Ma now, uh, Tom, you did a great job here because he started off saying um, that determin determinism without de if determinism is true, there is no truth. I think that's kind of what he's saying that there's no minds. There's no knowledge. And at the end, he kind of concedes that um, that determinism could be uh, the case, and you still have this concept of truth. And I think the reason why he backpedaled on this, and I'm not sure if I, I have it here, but the reason why he backpedaled on this is because, I think because Cameron Bertuzzi popped into his head that Calvinists exist. And Calvin, uh, the strong Calvinists, the hyper-Calvinists, don't believe in um, free will. They believe in determinism, but it's a theistic type one. And so he kind of had to back off on that. Mental states, and therefore there are no belief states and no knowledge states. So you're not talking about determinism, you're talking about naturalism. I'm talking about the most common concomitant of, nat of determinism, the most common actually held worldview that includes determinism, which is naturalism. Okay, but just strictly determinism, we could be determined by reality to believe true things. So it is the question. I mean, Cameron can read it again, but the question wasn't about an ism; it was about an ist. It wasn't about what a proposition entails; it was about what a person might hold, and and persons typically hold clusters of beliefs. Right. So he said a determinist, as in the position of determinism, not a naturalist, as in and the somebody who is a determinist is highly likely to also be a naturalist. Okay, so what you would grant... Unless you're a Calvinist. <laughs> ...that general determinism, it is possible to have knowledge. There are... I would have to know what kind of determinism the person was talking about. I'm there saying lots it, of, it could be any kind of determinism, it's still possible to have knowledge. Well, I mean, there's like lots, Calvinism. There's lots of different kinds of determinism. There's theological determinism, logical determinism, calls... Yeah, did Cameron just say Calvinism there? No. I'm there saying lots it, of, it could be any kind of determinism, it's still possible to have knowledge. Well, I mean, there's like lots, Calvinism. There's lots of different kinds of determinism. There's theological determinism, logical determinism, yeah, causal determinism, physical determinism. So I think Trent caught himself sort of, he had a backtrack. He, he, was, he has to say determinism can't lead to things like knowledge only in the naturalism worldview. Because again, it, it's God. God is the answer to everything. God, 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 God. God is what, it, what uh, enables free will. God is what enables um, these things called truth and knowledge. So I'm just saying any kind of determinism, it is possible many, much if there is indeterminism. The Roger Wade, I think uh, he is a doctor in um, philosophy of religion. Category of determinism is broad enough to have knowledge. Maybe. Okay. All right, Melissa Mitchell, question for Trent. When is personal revelation testimony, such as what Paul says in Galatians 1, 12 through 16, considered reliable? And can you answer? Consider reliable. That's an important po uh, point that I don't think Cameron stressed enough. That without begging the question or special pleading. I, I so in other words, when do you believe a person <laughs> um, when it comes to special revelation? If someone says, God told me to tell you, when would you consider that type of testimony reliable? Because that's basically what Paul's doing. Paul is saying, the Apostle Paul, the guy, you know, the guy in the New Testament, he's basically saying... A God told me to tell you something. Now, anytime that happens nowadays, unless you're in a Pentecostal church, most people gently step away and walk backwards slowly. If the Apostle Paul lived in our day and age, 
you Christians would walk away slowly from Paul. You'd be scared of him because he's telling you, everything I know is from the revelation of Jesus Christ, our Lord. You would think this guy is nuts. I literally thought what was coming was, can you answer this question without getting so excited that you knock something over? Um, could you read the question one more time? I'm, I'm not really sure I got it. When is personal revelation testimony, such as what Paul says in Galatians 1, 12 through 16, actually probably, go ahead. I think all personal here. revelation is testimony. Yeah. Okay, but the question, <laughs> he thinks all personal revelation is testimony, but the question is how reliable do you think it is? How good of a testimony is it? W would you believe it? In any case. So this is Galatians 1, 12 through 16. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard from my previous way of life in Judaism how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried yeah. to destroy it. He had the testimony of Jesus. It sounds well, like... He had the testimony of Jesus, Trent. You do realize that within the story of the Gospels um, and Acts, that Jesus left probably a couple years before Paul had this experience of Jesus. Left meaning, <laughs> even according to Christians, Jesus went up higher than sea level towards the clouds to this place called heaven. Jesus was gone, according to the story in Acts. But according to Paul, this Jesus who went up and left spoke to him. Now, the question that this questioner is asking is, how reliable do you think that testimony is from Paul? In other words, if I told you, Trent, that Jesus told me a few certain things, specific things, would you believe me? How? And if not, what would you need to believe me? And if you do believe me, what if I told you some things that you just don't like and goes against the Torah? Would you believe me then? What if it goes against certain epistles? Would you believe me then? Like, this is a great question because it gets to, um, do, you, do you just believe what people say? And how would you test it? Do you believe Muhammad, that he actually talked to Gabriel in a cave? Do you believe Joseph Smith, that he actually talked to the angel Moroni in, a, in some place? That's personal testimony. Now, if you believe Paul, why don't you believe Joseph Smith? If you believe Paul, why don't you believe Muhammad? You said all revelation is, is, is testimony and is evidence, right? But is it good? Is it reliable? That's me. What was the first part of the question? So the question was, when is personal revelation testimony, such as and what my, Paul yeah. says in Galatians and, 1? And my answer was always. And the example that was given there, Paul's just saying, I did not receive this testimony from mere men. No, the word mere is not in there. I, I don't think any translation has the word mere. I received this testimony from Jesus himself. That's awesome. But it's still, it's still testimony. I think yeah, the question is reliability, Trent. And I think Tom rightly points this out now, right now. By testimony, they mean evidence? Like kind of like eyewitness testimony? It seems like all, she's all asking about like, she's asking like Holy Spirit type personal revelation. Yeah, I think, look, I've actually got a, I've got a um, essay on this. In a book called um, e something Evidence and Virtue, edited by um, Tim O'Connor and Laura Callahan, and the second half of the essay actually specifically talks about um, the testimony of the Holy Spirit, um, and it's just it's uh, the testimony of the Holy Spirit's literally testimony. So personal revelation fr directly from the Holy Spirit is testimony from the Holy Spirit. But how do you know if it's directly from the Holy Spirit or if it's just not something made up in someone's head? How do you know? How do you figure it out? You remember earlier on, Trent, you said that you come to the knowledge of religion, religious things, the same way as you do with science. Okay, what is the scientific way to figure out <laughs> whether someone's personal inner testimony of the Holy Spirit in their life is actually from the Holy Spirit and maybe just their own brain? firing neurons and whatever answer you give you better be darn sure that you apply it consistently to every single religious experience on this planet because that's what science does so i think so again i'm sticking with my original answer 
um, all uh, all personal revelation is testimony, no matter what its source. Some 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 testimony is really special. I mean, Locke and Aquinas are actually um, of exactly one accord on this that um, uh, that revelation is essentially just the testimony of God Himself. Pretty special testimony, but it's still it's still a form of testimony. So, what do you think about that, Tom? Well, I mean, I would agree that uh, personal experience is absolutely a form of testimony, but I think. My interpretation of the question was that when is personal revelation like a form of reliable evidence that would be accepted in a court of law kind of a question. That's what I thought. They were. Yes, yes. The question re really is asking, when should you believe this testimony that a spirit talked to a person? I, Trent, I, sure, I really doubt you believe every claim that when someone says a deity spoke to me, even if it's your deity, surely you don't believe everyone. I hope you don't, because if you do, well, stay out of Pentecostal churches, because they'll pray, they'll put their hands on you, and they'll pray over your head, Trent, and they'll tell you specific things that are they say is directly from God. Yeah, it's just a, such a bad analogy, because the, I mean, if you look at the, the way that theists who argue abductively or in a Bayesian way, um, it's just flat out disrespectful that people have gone to such efforts to cash out the concept of God. You got Swinburne's coherence of theism. Oh, yeah. I just skipped ahead here. But this is a part where Tom said s something about how Christians or theists don't know the nature of, of God, can't know the nature of God. And, um, and Trent's basically saying this is so disrespectful. There's been so many great philosophers writing on the topic of the nature of God. Surely, Tom, you've read these great works and understand that we can come very close to knowing what this God's like. Um, and his book, The Christian God, um, where they go into great detail about the nature of God. And it's and the chapter that I think Tom most needs to read. I always use it for my first course I teach in set theory. All right, this one is from Adam Does SE. Okay, I already played this. This was uh, basically the personal testimony and uh, 16 years old messed with the wrong crowd, needed a new clean start, um, and found Christianity. Baptist, went to Liberty University, ends up becoming an Orthodox Christian and Roman Catholic at the end. And again, anybody who has Trent Doherty's ear, my question is, was his wife a Roman Catholic when he met her for the first time? I'm betting yes. I hope I'm wrong. This is the Pine Creek Theorem that women have converted more men to religion than the Holy Spirit could ever do. Okay, next question. Get the best of me. Uh, what I would want people to take away from what I've said is that you hear all the time that you still hear this, like on the intellectual dark web, which I listen to a lot, you still hear these claims that like Christians are anti-science or that Theology. Okay, this is his uh, closing statements. This is very important. So everything he said, which I, I skipped through a lot of it because this is a two-hour long video, but everything he said, he condensed it in three minutes, and I thought it was pretty good. But listen to... Uh, I, I don't know if I should preface this. I, I, yeah, I won't. I won't. I'm going to play it, and then I'll make a comment. It's like radically different than science, or Christians are fedious, and Christians don't believe... On the basis of evidence and Christians, you know, that faith is belief contrary to the evidence and things like this. And I'm like, that doesn't fit my experience at all. I mean, I, I pretty much don't know people like that. And um, if you read this wonderful book, Faith and Reason by Richard Swinburne, you'll see that that has really never been the tradition. And, uh, you know, the natural sciences took hold and grew up within a Christian worldview. And Stanley Yockey and um okay I'll, I'll butt in here everything i've heard to this point is please don't call christians stupid please don't call us irrational we love science we love evidence quit picking on us we're not stupid we're not dumb we have good reasons to believe this is what i'm getting from a PhD in philosophy of religion right now. And I don't understand it. I really don't. This is 
why in some ways I respect the presuppositional apologists more so than guys like Trent here. Because they don't care if you think they're stupid. They believe that what they believe is true. They own it. And as pompous and arrogant and rude as these presuppositionalists sound, at least they own it. With guys like Trent or, and other evidentialists that I've seen on YouTube, it's like, please don't think we're stupid. Do you think I'm rational for believing in Jesus? Do you? Do you? It's like, grow a pair. <laughs> I really think that the reason why there's so much apologetics out there today is to solve this problem of feeling stupid, feeling silly for what you believe. In fact, I'm looking at Cameron Bertuzzi right now, and I'm looking at you, Cameron. <laughs> I've almost heard you say those exact words. It's like, and then you sought out to confirm your beliefs, and wouldn't you know it, you found what you were looking for, that there were great reasons to believe, intellectual reasons to believe that a man rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. There's one other guy, I forget his name, but there's, there's some really good historians of science. Even um, Alfred North Whitehead admits this. Science arose in a, in a Christian context where people believed that, they, that human beings were made in the image of God, and therefore they had minds that could come. This, like right now, this PhD in the philosophy of religion sounds like um, your typical Baptist apologist right now. Frank Turek. I'm seeing Frank Turek right now. I'm seeing Vodi Bakum right now. <laughs> that without Christianity, you never science would never have got off the ground. Tell that to the Chinese. Comprehend the world, and that's what made investigation of the world both possible and worthy of doing, because you were thinking God's thoughts after you. And so it was my love of science that ultimately led me into theology. And not only did the Christian world really give birth to science. It's only within the Christian worldview that I think science will continue to, to flourish. Only, this, see, this is, okay, uh, this is probably going to be the rudest thing I say. This is going to be the rudest thing I say today about Trent. But what you just said, Trent, is not how intelligent people speak, in my opinion. This is not how smart people talk. I'm using the word only. Listen to this again, especially in this context. Not only did the Christian world really give birth, to science, it's only within the Christian worldview that I think science will continue to, to flourish. Only within the Christian worldview will science continue to flourish. You remember, Trent, how you were talking about <clears throat> that you just don't care for this definition of knowledge of, as a binary switch, you use either all knowledge or all not knowledge. Um, <laughs> I'm, hearing that, I'm hearing that binary switch here when it comes to science and religion. Only only, only within the Christian worldview will science flourish because it was what birthed uh, Christianity and science. To me, this is a ignorant thing for an academic to say, and it also shows insecurity, in my opinion, that you need this to be true. You hope it's true. It's like, look at my religion, how special it is. Please, all the people listening right now, all the Christians listening who are doubting, doubt no more, because we got, we got it. And without it, you won't even have a cell phone. And that as long as people um, embrace these kinds of skepticisms that Tom's embracing, which is a perfectly generic skepticism, it absolutely undermines science. You're left with this impoverished, milquetoast, watered down picture of science is just talking about our own experiences. And if you speaking of milk toast, I look like milk toast right now. I got to do something with my color. Look at the history of the of uh, the Vienna School and and the Ernst Mach Society and all this. We've already been here, man. We've already been here. The sort of naval contemplating view of science that sort of builds, you know, circles the wagons. Science will not flourish in that sort of skeptical, subjective world. It just okay, kids. Hey, you young young Christians listening, eight, between the ages eighteen twenty two, who are doubting. Doubt no more. You stay firm with Christianity, because without Christianity, you know, this, the world's going up. It's going down the toilet. <laughs> it won't. And I love science, and I want science to continue and to flourish. Um, and so um, it's important to me that people continue to believe that the world is rational and, and intelligible and knowable. And, that our, and, 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 and this is the clip I played on a loop. And knowable. 
uh, and if you came late, make sure you watch the very beginning. Um, he's he's admitted that knowledge. <laughs> he doesn't care about knowledge, but he cares about that the nature of God is knowable. The world is rational and, and intelligible, and knowable, and that our and and, and 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 that our minds were made to know the world because our minds are in the image of the divine mind, and therefore inquiry into the natural world through the natural sciences is almost an act of devotion and it just hurts my heart to see science trivialized by these sorts of subjectivisms and skepticisms subjectivisms and see he's almost painting tom into the postmodern corner i think that um that anybody who doesn't believe in god Anybody who's an atheist just doesn't believe in things called truth, um, that don't care about, you know, trying to get things reliably, that, that we care about believing true things. I think that's how he kind of views skepticism. Now, I, I agree some skepticism is irrational and, uh, you know, can lead to things like conspiracy theories and so forth. But, Trent, I think you're just as much as a skeptic as Tom and me. I hope you are. You just don't believe the vacuum salesman when he comes in and says this is the best vacuum in the world for $5,000. You're skeptical of that, right? Well, if so, you should be skeptical of the, some of the things that the Gospels record. Don't give the, the Gospels or even the Epistles, what Paul says, any special standing. Don't treat it as special. Don't treat your religion as special. <laughs> This is the thing. It's like, no, it is special, Doug. It's unique. It's the only religion. It's the only belief system. Christianity is the only one that does X. And then they'll just fill in all those things, thinking that that somehow makes it more probable. But anyhow, Tom, jump. If, you can, if you're still here, if you can hear me, um, go to my appear, and uh, you can hop on. And I'll take questions while we're waiting. Go to my appear, Tom. Uh, let me get the link for you. By the way, Trent, if you ever hear this, you're welcome to come on my channel. You're not going to like the questions I ask, though. And there will be, I, I predict, Trent, if you ever come on my channel, there will be at least, I predict, three people who will warn you not to. And if you do come on, they're going to say, be prepared for loaded questions, and, and, and that Doug will trap you. And what I encourage you is to do is embrace the trap, accept the trap. You have nothing to fear if what you believe is true. And you probably should uh, watch some of my <laughs> interviews with theists before you do. And my prediction is that you will not come on. Okay, so Tom says he's on his way. And let me give him the link. And let me see. Yeah, Tom, link's on the way. Check Facebook. What is going on with my lighting? Good to see you here, Joy. Raphael, yes, that feeling in his heart, the feeling of the Holy Spirit speaks to you in Revelation. How reliable is those feelings, I wonder, Raphael? I wonder how reliable Trent thinks those feelings are. There he is. Let me uh, capture your soul. Sorry, I didn't play more of you, but that's all right. Trent's more funny to me. Um, what did you think of my comments? Pretty good. I liked your advice about trying to challenge him on the probabilities thing. Like, if he sees things from a probabilistic standpoint, how does he contrast the belief in a god with the belief we can drop a cell phone? That's a, that's an interesting question to ask. Oh yes, they hate it. <laughs> they don't like those questions. Um, yeah, so if he admits that he doesn't like that binary switch idea that 
truth knowledge is always on or always off and say, okay, let's just compare claims that you believe that you hold dear. In fact, ask, ask a guy like that, if you ever come to that situation, what are the, the three most deeply held beliefs you have that you think are true? And what, there's going to be God exists, Jesus rose from the dead, if they're Christian, and maybe something else. And then just compare each one to something falling. And I tell you, they're going to backtrack. Well, these are different categories, Tom. But with a guy like Trent, he can't say that because he's just admitted his epistemology is the same as the scientific method. Right. So he's kind of stuck. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff he talked about that, was, that I thought was interesting about the philosophy, the distinctions and stuff, bringing up uh, fallibilism. So that's something that's brought up before. Fallibilism, essentially what it is, is this, the assumption that if we assume that some proposition is true and it has some kind of justification to it, well, then we can call it knowledge. But the whole point of my position is, is, well, how do you know it's true in the first place? You can't just assume it's true. And how do you justify that? So just calling fallibilism doesn't really support his position at all. Well, it's just a dodge. Like you, you don't think we can actually know metaphysical truths, correct? Or right. That, yeah. With, with one exception. Oh, yeah. The existence? Okay. Yeah, I think therefore I am. Yeah. So I actually think Trent believes that as well. What do you mean? Because I got the other, the alternative impression. His, he seems to think that science can tell us what the fundamental nature of reality is, what absolute truth is, even if we don't have absolute certainty. No, but remember what he said? It's, he said it's in terms of probabilities. We apportion our beliefs to the evidence and so he admitted it's about probabilities. Right. But he thinks that those probabilities can indicate the absolute truth, the absolute way reality really is. Okay. So the way we had figured out if that's, if you guys are on the same page or not, is, to, is if you would have asked him the question, what is the probability that your God exists between zero and a hundred? I, if, if he says a hundred, then I think you guys are in a disagreement, but I don't think he would. I think he would say 99.9. Or something like that. And then you can talk about whether that's really a difference between 100 and 99.9. .9, but I think he would leave himself uh, wiggle room. Well, I, I think I agree he would not say 100% because that would go against his, his worldview. But I think the difference between our positions is that I don't think we can get a percentage and say that the, our understanding of science gives us some percent reliability that this is the fundamental nature reality is. Where he says we can that's the difference. So my, my perspective is that the percentage point, the probabilistic assessment we have is the model we can construct of reality, but we can't claim it is reality or that it's some percent reliable of what the fundamental nature of reality is. It doesn't tell us that. We don't have a way to compare our current information with some underlying reality stuff to really know that it is, in fact, representative of reality. But he's saying, yes, we can. He's saying, yep, this probability is some percent representative of the way reality actually really is, even if we can't get there. Even if we don't have anything to reference that, it's just some, some probability. It does represent the actual way reality is. Okay, I see what you're saying. It's some probability that it represents the actual way things are. But you would disagree with that? Right. I'm saying that we can't really establish that probability because of the analogy I used with the napkins. Like if, if I said I could hold I infinitely see, many see. napkins, how many finite, what finite number of napkins can I hold? And how does that relate to the probability? Like all of our sense experience, all of our experience of the world would be like the napkins. It's all of a finite number of uh, examples of inductive examples of what we can say. Okay. But okay. How much of that qualifies into a percent of what that infinite could possibly be? Have you seen the show Young Sheldon? Big Bang Theory, Young uh, Sheldon? I've, no, I have not. It's oh. rather recent. It's a nice, I don't even have a TV subscription, so. Okay. Young Sheldon is like, I don't know, 13 years old, 12 years old, and uh, he's at church, and some Baptist preachers said that, you know, God either exists or he doesn't. So it's 50-50. I like those odds. <laughs> <sighs> so what if Trent Horn, Trent, why did I call him Trent Horn? Trent says that... Um, that it's, I can give you a probability that God's omniscient, omnipotent. It's 50-50. He either is or he isn't. What would you say to that? Uh, just as the initial Bayesian prior, that would be correct. But then you'd have to add in, what exactly does that mean? What does omniscience mean? Omniscience means that you, knows absolute, that you know absolutely everything that there is to know. There's nothing you don't know. 
But now, in order to know that someone knows absolutely everything, you would have to also know absolutely everything to know that they don't. there's not something that they don't know. Otherwise, because if you don't, then that's like saying you have a finite number of napkins. You have a finite number of information. You're trying to make a judgment about this infinite quality. And so what is, what is the probability? How does this relate? If yeah, yeah. What number of napkins can I hold can relate to the infinite amount of holding napkins? Like how, do you, how do you assess that probability? And like so, he admitted at the end, you can't. You don't have enough information, which is my entire point. That is the grounds of my position. You don't have enough information to make those kinds of claims. So you would say, and I think I would say, that it takes a deity to know one. Right. But he would say, no, because I, I spit in the face of certainty. So I know my God. But when he says no, he doesn't mean with absolute certainty. He means like, right. he means like 95%. I'm 95. I, I love my God 95% of the way because he 95% exists. Right. So my position is that if you want to know an omni property, you're going to have to justify it with some kind of omni evidence. But he's saying, no, 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 I don't need that. We, we can justify it with just normal scientific evidence. We can justify all powerful. It's just this, this kind of this raising from the dead evidence of this testimony. That totally justifies an all powerful being. Hmm. Yeah. Do you think he can, he kind of conceded that to you at the end, but do you think he really did or just. Did he realize he did? <laughs> I don't think he realized he did because I didn't, I didn't have enough time to really articulate because I was coming up with this off the top of my head. So I didn't have enough time to really process it and make it as clear as possible to the point where he'd really be able to understand what I, the point I was making. But since he did understand the, the relationship between you given a finite amount of data, you can't just say what, how, what probability that is or how that relates to an infinite amount like of saying, if, if I claim I can lift an infinite number of napkins, what finite number of napkins can increase that to like 1%, 5% likely to be true, 10% likely to be true? Like there's no numbers that are going to get you there. It's just because I can hold 100 billion napkins, would that be evidence I can hold infinite? Well, no, because 100 billion is exactly 0% of infinite. And I can hold 100 billion gluons in my hand. Are you convinced I can hold infinitely many gluons? Probably not. Yeah. I, I saw what you did with the napkin thing, but I actually think it would have been better if you just had like a catchy phrase, like it takes a God to know one. Yeah, well, I was coming off it off the top of my head, so it was the best I could do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay. Um, yeah, as soon as, like, did the thought occur to you that as soon as he's mentioned that his epistemology for God and religion is the same as science, that just start comparing, uh, especially with the whole idea of why is it that different cultures, different scientists from different cultures and different geographies all end up on the same conclusion on some claims, but you don't see that in religion? Well, I, I, because the topic was what epistemology should we use and not specifically is there evidence of a God, I kind of leaned away from that because if we started to go down the route of, well, is this really evidence of a God, then we start talking about epistemology and say, well, hey, you see, we're using the normal epistemology, so yep, that's, that's my point, position, and we just... It would, it would give him a debate point if I tried to do that, because he would just be able to say, you see, I'm clearly just using the normal epistemology to get here, whether you agree with the conclusions or not. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I, there was some relationship between this debate you had and the one you had with Eric Hernandez, especially when it came to consciousness. Um, I really tried my hardest on to try to figure out a way to review that one, but it's so messy. <laughs> <sighs> it was such... Uh, it like her Eric Hernandez is a I, I feel sorry for the guy I really do and I shouldn't even, shouldn't even say that but he, he he was brought up in a nice evangelical Christian charismatic leaning type church where people prayed over him and said he's going to do great things for the world and be this great apologist and now he's trying to do that and but just seeing him with you and uh, with um, Matt Dillahunty. <laughs> did you watch that one with? Yeah, him? I did. I did. I watched that one to actually prepare for my debate with uh, with him. Like he was so nervous with Matt. He wasn't nervous with you, but it's almost like the best way to describe Eric Hernandez with you was like a little male poodle dog <laughs> puffing his chest up uh, and, and barking, but yet had no teeth. <laughs> That's why I felt sorry for the guy. 
Hmm. But maybe I don't know. Maybe some someday we'll look at it. I. You know, I honestly, some of these guys are just trying to make a living, and so I feel sorry if I. Um, I don't know. But maybe I should. Yeah, I, I was. I wasn't as upset with Prince about all the book promotions because he recently lost his job. So if he's trying to make a living with that, I wouldn't hold that against him. Oh yeah, uh, Chet in the chat um, said something about that. I don't. He has a history. He's he was um, allegedly accused of some um, things. Yeah. Just, yeah, I'm it, aware. I'm yeah, aware. but I'm I'm assuming that he's innocent of those things, um, and because um, he never was formally charged, and I think he ended up suing them or something and won. I don't know if that story is true or not. I my yeah. interpretation was probably not. I don't think there was a lawsuit on either side, but I don't think it matters. I'm I'm interested more in. Yeah his ideas and his perspective. I don't care about his background. I don't care if he's a good person or a bad person. Brenda Von Austin is asking, how do you handle criticisms of the cog cogito? Do you know what she's asking? The cogito ergo sum. I think therefore I am. How do I handle criticisms? Oh, of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, it depends on the criticism. I mean, I've had a couple of my atheist philosopher friends, uh, argue against it and saying, well, what does the I refer to? And so my response is that I think the 4am tells us two things. It says I exist and reality exists and there's some relation between these two things. It could be the case that I am a product of reality like materialism, or it could be the case that I and reality are two separate things like dualism, or it could be the case that reality is a property of me like solipsism. But I don't know which one is the case. So I'm not actually answering the question, what is the I? I'm only saying that I exist because of my experience. My thoughts are me and they are what are existing. Those mean the same thing. And I don't know what I am or what produces them or what the order is or how long I've existed. None of that matters. All that matters is that I, the thinking, exists and there is some relation between me and reality. And that's all it tells you. Well, there you and go. The uh, Trent's particular criticism, uh, his fallibilism version is a critique of the language used it's not a critique of the conclusion so he still grants that you can have the conclusions can be true you just can't be certain about the language and what it represents so he was still granting the possibility of absolute certain or absolute truth even if we just not absolute justification do you have uh trent's email address i don't i just got his contact from uh cameron through cameron Okay. Um, but Cameron mentioned at the end that Trent would be willing to come on any show, so I think you could invite him. Yeah, I you know I would love to run the library experiment, experiment or like just comparing his uh, poof or drown. Yeah, poof or drown. His probability assessments of certain claims compared to scientific ones, and my guess is he will become very fidgety. I actually don't know because he seems like a really smart guy in my opinion. I think he would be an interesting person to have on your show to see what his responses would be. So because I think it would be a lot like what I did when you asked me certain questions about when I think in our like second live chat, you said, well, you, you answer from the perspective of a theist and what would you say? That was a really interesting conversation we had. I think it would be a lot like that. Yeah, but I don't think he's – well, maybe maybe he has, but I don't think he's been asked questions point blank like is your confidence higher that a, a pen will fall when you let go to – or that Jesus rose from the dead. Like, for him to have his church, his wife, his kids hear him answer, no, I'm more confident that a pen will fall. Like, that's, that, that doesn't build up the community of believers, right? So, um, so those types of questions they do not like. Uh, you have, there's another question for you here. Oh, and I, I think he's not a philosopher of religion. I think he's an analytic philosopher. I think he actually has a PhD in mathematics and uh, analytic philosophy, logic. Ah, good correction. So he's got he's got a serious degree in those fields. Got it. Uh, someone asked how you handle. Oh, Paul James, does Tom ever get frustrated with the deliberate condens condensation of some Christian apologists when they use it in debate tactic? No, actually, I don't really. My perspective is is that I only care about the ideas being presented because my my goal is to learn from what they're saying to try and improve my model. So I don't really care how condescending they are. 
even though I'll end up being condescending back just because I can. It's more fun. But from my perspective, nothing about the debater matters to me. I don't care how nice they are, how mean they are, how old they are, uh, what their background is. All I care about is the arguments that they're presenting and whether or not they're good or bad and what I can learn from them. I want, if I was ever to go in former debates, I would want the other side to be condescending towards me. And then what I would do is I would muster up a little tear here. <laughs> <laughs> Get the pity and the sympathy from the people on the uh, sitting in the, on the fence. Um, Frozen Sea asked Doug, what, which method of apologetics do you think is causing more people to leave Christianity? Precept or evidentialism? I don't, I don't think it matters. I think they're both uh, destructive, but probably evidentialism because they'll f find out things they didn't know that will cause them to doubt even more. Yeah, I'd actually agree. I think that if they start to ground their belief on facts and science, and the more they learn about facts and science that disconfirms their belief, it'd probably shake their faith if they ground it in evidentialism. Yeah. Nicholas Brown says, Trent would probably immediately go on the attack if I was to do what I was saying about the reason you're asking those types of questions. Um, yeah, uh, Nicodemus, you could be right. Like, why are you asking me these questions? I would say, I put my cards on the table. I'd say, my goal here trend is for you to doubt your your deeply held belief in god to lead you and your children to satan <laughs> and then i would give a little smile and then he would smile yeah i i honestly think that if you're an atheist listening right now and you're talking to a christian and they're asking why are you asking these questions if you have a good smirk as part of your repertoire use it and say, I'm trying to lead you to hell. And I tell you, because that's what they're thinking anyhow, so you might as well just say it, get it out in the open, and then say, you know, and then you can even ask, do you mind if I try to lead you to hell? <laughs> <laughs> and then you can, you can kind of, now once it's all in the open, they have two choices. They can either engage with you or run away because they think you're possessed or something, I don't know. Hey, Kaylin, good to see you here again. Oh, uh, someone asked a question about being mods. I only have four mods, and you have to know me for at least five years in order to become a mod. And I have to have uh, talked to you for at least 100 hours. I would even make you, Tom here a mod. <sighs> I don't know who you are, Tom. <laughs> yeah, if you made me a mod, I'd just give everyone like 10,000 pine points. They just start buying stuff from your home, like trade in 5,000 pine points. Here's Doug's $500 vacuum. Yeah, it's a matter of trust. I don't trust Tom Jump. Who is this guy? He's from Minnesota. You don't trust people from Minnesota? Okay. Aren't you a Canadian? <laughs> what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> <sighs> okay, let me, um, let me play. Did you see the loop? Uh, at the beginning? Yeah. Did you see it? Uh, part of it. I joined a little bit late. Okay. Let me, um, let me end the show with, with the loop. And uh, you can mute yourself, and I'll talk to you when we're done. So, in other words, we're discussing religious belief and whether it counts as knowledge. I already said I don't care about knowledge. Okay, fine. You don't want me to know? that God exists because I can't be absolutely certain. Okay, fine, I don't care. I don't need knowledge for anything. So um, it's important to me that people continue to believe that the world is rational and, and intelligible and knowable. My enthusiasm for how much I don't care about the concept of knowledge actually caused me to knock the computer over and that our, and, 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 and that our minds were made to know the world. I don't care about knowledge. I, well, I, I, I gotta say, I. I know a thing or two about the theory of knowledge, um, so that's not the problem. I just don't care. Um, it's important to me that people continue to believe that the world is rational and, and intelligible and knowable, and that our and and, and 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 that our minds were made to know the world. So, in other words, we're discussing religious belief and whether it counts as knowledge. I already said I don't care about knowledge. Okay, fine. You don't want me to know that God exists because I can't be absolutely certain? Okay, fine, I don't care. I don't need knowledge for anything. So um, it's important to me that people continue to believe that the world is rational and, and intelligible.